Welcome to Saltivation. The Saltivation Show is a podcast series featuring the leading voices in salt, where we talk about the issues and strategies to help you make sense of state and local tax. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 75. It's been three years and 75 episodes. Who would have thought? Today, we have an unknown voice, the woman behind the curtain, Christine Newkirk, our director of marketing communications, making us look good, making us famous, who, contrary to maybe some of the uh, the dialogue that has been coming out in episodes, was actually her brainchild, did the research, found our producer, hooked this up. So Christine and I thought it would be fun to just kind of like recap on 75 episodes, really? 75 things out in the ethos. So... Hi, Christine. About state and local tax. About state and local tax. <laughs> yeah, see, the, the the communications director always keeping us honest and making <laughs> sure we put those words in there, right? Exactly. Well, the um, podcast started, it's hard to believe it's been three years. And yeah. August, year. eight, August 14th, 2020 was the first wow. episode drop. Wow. And um, where we started and where we are today is vastly different in how we approach the podcast, but the topics are still about the same. State and local tax is is never dull. It's never static. It's always moving. So there's always a new topic to talk about and a new sort of challenge that you guys are overcoming. So it's been great to invite a variety of people onto the show. Yeah, so the first episode for those people who are new, welcome to 75. You got 74 to catch up on. Those who have been there since the beginning, thanks for coming back. You can stick around. I think we're going to rebroadcast that original episode. But that first episode, I was not in. I was not part of it. So that format was, you know, Tram, Judy, Alex, and Stacy kind of compiling a list of five common questions that we often get as a team. I laugh because it seemed, right, we didn't really know what w- what it was going to be, right? I think Diane Yetter was lined up as our next guest because um, Judy had talked about it, but I don't think no one, anyone really knew what we were going to do with it, right? Also, four months post COVID lasted more than two weeks, but come <laughs> August, we're still all at home. Right. And no one really knew what was going to happen. And so it was kind of a way to to get by and maintain that connection that everyone was kind of looking for. Not sure if it was meant to be like a short term, long term solution. But again, here we are. Right. And I mean, Diane I was our first. She was with the Sales Text Institute. And so that was fun to start out with a broad brush on some of these topics. But if you were naming some of the things, those five things that were addressed in that first episode today, would any of those issues be any different? I think so. Like from a fundamental level, right? Obviously, we think state and local tax is important. That's why we've been making, you know, careers of it for however long, anywhere from 12 to almost 30 years, you know, from people on our team. But yeah, we're still having conversations daily about how hard it is to comply, how to comply, what it means, you know, and then consequences associated with not complying. Those conversations are still there. Yeah. And then some of our clients do, or some of the potential clients that we talk to are still like, well, hey, why didn't my, why didn't my CPA tell me about this? Conversations are still happening. Nexus, always, 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 right? And then Square is a marketplace. I had never heard that question, but we do continually have marketplace discussions. We just released or recorded a current event discussing marketplaces. So shameless plug, you can scroll through your podcast feed and find our team video or kind of our YouTube clip on that. So obviously, three years later, we're still talking about marketplaces because we just chose to record a, <laughs> record something on it. So, yeah, none of yeah, those. We do get clients are- contacting us, new prospective clients every week, and there was one this week 
There was one last week with the same questions about marketplace. So we know yep. these issues are out there. Businesses are having trouble figuring out the right way to attack. Yeah. And I think three years later, there might be a little bit more clarity, but also a little bit more confusion because mar- you know marketplaces often are technology focused, right? They're feeding a need from a technological standpoint and sales standpoint as technology evolves, marketplaces evolves, duties evolve. And the laws don't evolve fast enough to, you know, keep up with that technological evolution. So I think it's always going to be something there. Well, bringing up the laws that sort of lag what's happening and policy changes and developments, we um, have highlighted a number of folks over the years in these 75 episodes that are policy wonks that are able to speak to both sides of either tax reform or tax changes, either at the federal level or the state level, and then um, what that may look like for businesses. In addition to that, we've also been able to profile some people that follow the cases that are important, that that contribute to uh, creating the laws. So anything stand out in your mind on, on any of those guests? I mean... From like a personal perspective, I really enjoy talking to the attorneys, right? The running joke within our firm, I am just a CPA. Stacy is just a CPA. Alex is just an attorney. We are not dual licensed. So I always find the the conversations with attorneys interesting just because, you know, I kind of joke that I play an attorney on TV. I will never hold myself out to be an attorney because I am not. But it is that interpretation of the law and watching it go from a position to a, an actual decision because we do live in that gray and seeing people litigate that gray to get to you know some clarity is, is interesting for me. And I like to kind of listen to them talk about procedure, how they got there. You know, I think... Some of the converse, recent conversations I think we had with Olga and Masha, just some of the positions from a practitioner perspective that the states were taking that, you know, they had clients that were willing to litigate. They, you know, just how egregious some of those positions were. And just, you know, those are, it's nice to hear like taxpayer wins and also, you know, applaud. And we had even kind of talked about this in the conversation, you know, their clients for taking things to court because so many things are had settled behind the scenes and there is no precedent established when it's not out there. So I always just really like the, the conversations with attorneys and the litigators because it's a world that I live in. Right. But I don't, but I can't practice it. Right. Right. You know, along those lines of what you mentioned with uh, Ola and Masha, uh, was it Jordan Goodman who talked about there is an actual way to go about a case with the process that's in place for comments and whatnot. And when, Uh, not necessarily a case, but for a new law. And uh, when those steps aren't followed, that's when it does turn, it can turn into a case and where we can see some pushback on what's happening in the regulatory environment. And I found that really interesting in Mm -hmm. one of our most recent episodes is that discussion about the regulatory environment and how it can end up in the courts when it's not, executed as it should. So. Yeah. So a little peek behind the curtain. Um, while Christine, you have yet to hear her voice on this podcast. She has listened to all, all hours of these episodes. She's transcribed them, put them out there, picked, you know, quote bubbles, clips for YouTube and whatnot. So thank you, Christine, for all of, all of your work. I'm not sure if We've said that or really showed you that level of appreciation, but thank you. Well, thank you. The other (laughs) folks behind this podcast are our production team, and that's TruthWork Media with Michael Yoder. And he um, has sort of ushered us through creating this podcast from the very beginning. And it's really nice to have that longevity at this point, three years in. And so what do you expect going forward? What do you hope to see? We have... So many followers and and people listening at this point. I think I'd, I think it would be interesting to bring back some of our guests. You know, some of our earlier guests, kind of doing a similar thing. Of you know, three years ago, we were talking about this, and then also just bringing on more just 
more people, um, you know, from various organizations. Again, I like the attorneys. So to the extent that attorneys want to participate, I'm grateful for this kind of podcast and the opportunity to get to know more people, you know, probably on my own would have never had the opportunity to talk to, you know, Jared or Catherine from, you know, tax foundation. So grateful to grateful to the people who are just saying yes. So was there anything more that you had kind of written down as you were reflecting on this first episode that you wanted to comment on that has changed. Obviously, one of the things that has changed is Meredith stepped up as as our host <laughs> of the am. podcast. Yeah. Thank you, Meredith. You've done a fantastic job. Me, so. me and my ego, I. <laughs> so I um, so ushered up. in some really good conversations. So, um, was there anything else on the? Well, it, it was kind of going back to the the COVID thing, and I've you know, my husband and I watch a lot of stand up, And so I remember, you know, like listening to kind of the, the thought bubbles on, you know, some, some post pandemic stand up routines and how it's like, you don't want to focus on that. Right. Cause it's a moment in time and who knows how well that's going to age. Right. And so in this recording, Judy had mentioned that, you know, kind of when we were talking about concert, we, as you know, the team was talking about consequences and why state and local tax matters. One, the presumption being that all the states were going to come out of the the pandemic, you know, in a, in a huge revenue deficit. I don't think that was the case, but also, you know, increased enforcement over the next kind of year. Well, we are living in an enforcement world. Like we are It seems like once a week getting, you know, an audit letter from either the home rule cities in Colorado or the state of Pennsylvania for a service company, just checking things out. So enforcement is real. And three years out, we are really, really seeing that. I don't think it was possible to know what would happen on that first episode when Judy had mentioned increased enforcement, you know, August 2020. But we are truly living it, you know, now, you know, just yesterday we had a, a company, a very well-known local company reach out and say they're being audited by the city of Castle Rock, right? That's enforcement at its finest. There's a lot of contributing factors to that. Wayfair being one of them, kind of just resourcing, getting your hands around things, um, statute limitations running out on some of these new registrations, right? Wayfair was five years ago took people a while to get their hands around like what that meant. So a lot of registrations probably came in two, three years post Wayfair and the statute of limitations is running out on those. So that's something that just like really kind of stuck out to me when I was re-listening to that first episode regarding, yeah, just what that moment in time looked like and how maybe a year after that recording, not so much enforcement, because I think we were still really living in COVID times, right? We had surges, we had the vaccine rolling out, so all sorts of things. But like three years later, 100% for sure, a new piece of mail comes every day to our clients in various capacities. When you listened to this original episode, what were your thoughts? (laughs) Well, so there's episode one that I laugh because I know like the true personalities of my teammates where I think Alex said something and I just had to laugh where he's like, you know, Tram, that's a really excellent point. And it's just like the formality, like I love Alex and he's never that formal. Right. (laughs) But I then being the glutton for punishment that I am, I listened to episode two, which was my first episode with Diane Yetter and my voice and I think I even sent you a text after I listened to this. It was just like, <laughs> OMG, can we retract this? Can I re-record the intro? Like my voice is shaky. I have a very nervous personality. I get nervous, like I get nervous for everything. But my voice was so shaky. <laughs> I was I would talk really, really, really fast or like try to like read something, like over-prepare, get in my head. And I can hear myself like gradually through the episode 
calm down, but then I can hear myself gradually through, you know, the episodes in general, calm down, be more confident in me and myself. And it's, you know, what that means. Um, and so that second episode is really, which is more of the format that we're doing now, right? Like we have a, it's me and Judy, we have a guest speaker, you know, we have generally like a tentative outline of questions that we want to kind of talk about, but yeah, my voice is so incredibly shaky. It's, 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 it's amusing. (laughs) I actually do remember, (laughs) but it is. And, and then the way, when we um, have the opportunity to invite new guests on, often talk to them about it being a free-flowing discussion. And that's very much the way I feel our episodes are. It's a free-flowing discussion about the issues that businesses are facing today. So um, should we let folks listen to it? I think we should. So again, for all of those who are new, welcome. Thank you for joining us. For those who are who have been with us since the beginning, our deepest level of gratitude and thank yous. So here is episode one of the Saltivation podcast and enjoy. Welcome to Saltivation. The Saltivation show is a podcast series featuring the leading voices in salt, where we talk about the issues and strategies to help you make sense of state and local tax. Welcome to the Saltivation Podcast. Our goal here is to share our knowledge, our stories, be your resource, and help you make sense of salt. Now, we're not talking about the salt that you put in food uh, to make it taste better. We're actually talking about state and local tax. I'm Tram Lee, and I'm a member of the Saltivation team at Tax Ops. I also teach state and local tax to grad students at the University of Texas at Arlington. I am also a CPA and an attorney and found my way into SALT about 10 years ago. Um, In my last year of law school, I took a state and local tax class and just really liked it. It just totally made sense to me. Whereas my classmates who were either law school students or graduate tax students, they hated the class or they were just confused. So I just feel like SALT has been a really good fit for me because my CPA side really enjoys looking at the number, analyzing them. And then the lawyer side really likes to figure out the gray areas of SALT. Prior to state and local tax, I worked in the government sector. I helped federal agencies improve their operations. I got to influence the administration of tax laws and policy. So all in, I've got about 20 years of dealing with government at the federal, state, and local level. Hi, my name is Judy Vondren. I am the head of the state and local tax practice at uh, Tax Ops. I've been practicing this in this area for 25 years. I am also a CPA and an attorney. And like Tram, for whatever reason it is, my brain works really well around the complexities of the legal issues that state and local tax requires to um, kind of vet, as well as the practical application of state and local tax, where you actually have to put a number on a form. And I started my career in public accounting, uh, the big eight, big 12, I don't know, 25 years ago, it's hard to remember. I call it the final four now, the largest firms in our world. And I kind of got into the state local practice after I was outsourced to a company that was selling office supplies um, at the ready. And I got outsourced to do their sales tax compliance for a period of time. And the partner had said to me, well, it's really clerical. And of course, he didn't really know what I was doing. My manager didn't know what I was doing. And so I was sort of alone in this area. And what was very clerical was actually very stressful because I was remitting a million dollars of tax a month to California alone and filing 60 to 70 sales tax returns. And on the heels of that, I had just prepared all their state and local tax income tax compliance returns. And then I you know, was working on their sales tax compliance. And I just didn't realize just how complicated and how much money was being remitted to all these various governments. And I was doing these returns on coupons, coupon books, right? I mean, all manual, uh, assimilating data from various companies they had purchased and then creating a return. And then I was best friends with AP so I could get a check at the ready. I would run to the post office and have those envelopes date stamped so those returns could be timely filed. So we've come a long way in the 25 years I've been practicing from the manual compliance process to the automated ACH, EFT process that we see online. But 
even that there's been a lot of transition. So it's just been a really fascinating area to practice in and I've really enjoyed it. And that's why I've continued to do it all these years. Hey everyone, I'm Alex Corsion. I've been uh, working in state and local tax for approximately 15 years. I got, uh, I'm also an attorney. I got recruited directly into the state local tax practice for one of the big four firms right out of law school. And then I, I was a, a in big four and also at some regional firms throughout my career. And, you know, like Tram and Judy said, this, this is really an interesting puzzle and state and local tax lends itself pretty well, I think, to a statutory interpretation and kind of navigating that gray area that exists when laws are not written specifically to to business and are not keeping track with with business. So it's uh, it's been an interesting 15 years and, and hopefully uh, I can uh, share a nugget of two with you guys. And I'm Stacy Roberts. Uh, I'm the last of the Saltivation members with you today, at least. And um, I have 24 years of experience in state and local tax. I started my career in what was Big Five at the time in Chicago. And like many other salt professionals, I started in federal tax compliance, so on the income tax side, and then got my first taste of state and local tax basically by doing and preparing and reviewing state income tax returns. And like the rest of us that are part of this group, uh, I found the SALT side way more interesting. Like Alex said, puzzles. And those of us that are in this profession, I think we enjoy puzzles. And as time has gone on, um, I cut my teeth at other firms in public accounting. So I was a big four. I was big five when I started, then went to big four. And then I actually also went in-house for a few years for a Fortune 500 company. So that gave me a completely different perspective. And um, then boomeranged back into public accounting because I felt that client service was a little bit more suited for my personality. And um, have been doing... I was at a regional firm for six years. And then now here with the rest of the group at Tax Ops and, and the Saltivation team, and I think, uh, as you probably are hearing from all of us, we definitely have a passion for this work. And we've all, in some ways, worked together in prior lives and share the same vision. So hopefully we will be able to provide some insights to you as our podcasts go on. All right. Thanks, Stacey. So now that you all got to know us a little bit, we're going to jump into our topic today. We're going to cover some real-life questions that we've received from businesses and uh, tax professionals who attend our webinars, who log into our website and ask, sends us questions uh, about SALT. So the, the first one here is a question that we get from businesses all the time. What do we need to do to comply with SALT? Why does this matter and why should we care? And I think I'll take that one. So, you know, it's just so interesting because as I was mentioning, I've been doing this a long time and it was sort of a, as all of us have stated, it was sort of a, we don't want to do this. <laughs> A lot of people don't really like this area of tax because of the complexity, because you're dealing with 50 United States. We have over 10,000 local jurisdictions. So tax lays upon tax, lays upon tax, and you can't always get a nice answer. And if you're a CPA, you want a debit and you want a credit. And I think when you're a lawyer, you kind of learn to think um, into complexity to evolve and be creative. But the truth is every business needs to understand their state and local tax footprint. Whether you're in Texas or Colorado or California or New York, there are a litany of taxes that apply to your business. So those could be an income-based tax. Those could be a state and local sales tax. Those could be a property tax, a payroll tax. There are layer upon layers of taxes across our nation that apply to each and every business that it, that is taking place in America, whether it be a flow-through entity, whether it be a C-corporation, whether it be an individual with a subchapter C sort of, I have my own little side business, I might have some state and local tax issues that I need to address. So even the smallest of businesses to the largest have state and local tax issues. And unfortunately, or fortunately, I suppose for us, those laws have evolved over time. So if we think about a sales tax, that came out in 1922 in West Virginia of all states. They started the first state and local sales tax. And from there, Tennessee, Mississippi, and then so on and so on and so on. And now today we have 45 United States out of the 50 plus DC, making it 46 
By the way, D.C. is not a state, which is much to their chagrin, um, but they have a state and local sales tax, and they also have income-based taxes. So a lot of that has evolved over the history of laws, the industries in those places, of how they need to provide for roads and school districts and fire departments and police force and so forth is all typically paid for by state agencies. So they need to raise the revenues that the federal government are or are not giving them, the deficits from their citizenry. And whether that be a citizen actually living and working in a state or coming into a state and doing business there and making money off those citizens. And so that's why state and local tax is so important from the very smallest business in America to the very largest. And quite honestly, even for international businesses selling to the U.S. market. I mean, there are 330 million Americans and we like to buy stuff. We're a very consumer-driven society and we buy lots of cool things. And that could be coming to your front doorstep now that we're in COVID uh, times. The biggest highlight of my day is getting an Amazon package that could be as simple as a mop. But that's an excitement for me that the doorbell is ringing and something is happening because I'm not leaving my house much. And, and so, Judy, in terms of the importance, right, I think another aspect of that is like the potential consequences of not understanding these complex laws across the U.S., right? That's correct. And so spending all that time at the big four where I was dealing with the largest companies of our nation, multinational companies with significant liabilities across the nation, right? And they put process around trying to comply. They bought up entities. They they were, you know, billion dollar companies, hundred million, bill, you know, lots and lots of money is coming into that business. And then you go to the smallest business. So say you're a million dollar business, but everything you sell is taxable for a sales tax purpose. If you need to tax those goods and you don't tax them properly, $1 million times an average state and local sales tax rate of 8% is $80,000 of tax you didn't collect across whatever those sales were. So if you had a duty to do that and you are found to be liable for that, that's on you as a vendor. So you might very well have to eat the tax you didn't collect from your end users. And if you think about Amazon changing the character of our market in America, you know, we went from a society based on bricks, meaning store brick and mortar stores. You walked in to Sears, which was honestly the first Amazon. If you think about their Sears and Robot catalog, I loved going through that when I was a little kid and planning all the black and white toys that I wanted on Christmas that I never got but we'll digress, not digress there. But regardless, that was a, a very large sales tax collector. You went in the store, you ordered your goods. Maybe it was delivered to the store. You went and picked it up. You paid the sales tax at the storefront. Well, now we're getting things dropped off at our front door and Amazon changed the character of United States business and they did not collect sales tax until just recently on business to consumer sales. So you and I were supposed to self-report that tax. Well, that's ridiculous. We don't do that. We don't have the mechanism to do that. And therefore, we are not doing it. So $67 trillion of consumer um, taxes were not getting remitted across the nation to the various governments. And that's why we saw the Wayfair law get enacted at, in South Dakota and then supported by our Supreme Court. So the consequence is very large for noncompliance if you're a vendor or a company doing business in a multitude of states and ma managing your liability. And I learned from going from the big four to a regional firm where we had 46, 56,000 clients operating, you know, maybe in a smaller footprint, I would get a notice from one state and uh, the partner would say, well, why do you have this notice? What do we do about it? And I would say, the bigger question is, what are we doing and why are we getting a notice from this state that we're not even located in? Well, we're selling to that state and we might have a duty to comply. And then the bigger question is, what are we doing to get a market outside our outside our state of domicile? So it really adds up to substantial liability. And so we always look at the money owed versus the cost to comply. And those typically end up being worth it. It's worth it to spend the money to comply because the liability is so large on the business if they are not in compliance. That's an excellent point, Judy, because the the tax, the incidence of the tax generally falls to the end user, but the business is the one that's getting audited and can get stuck with the, uh, the liability at the end of the day. So the business is paying out of pocket money that is technically owed by the consumer. So that's, that's I think, a key element of why this is critical. Right. And, you know, it's funny. I think a lot of people, you know, now we know Amazon's collected tax, but we, over the years, saw significant assessments from governments across our nation to the tune of millions and hundreds of millions of dollars of assessments were imposed against Amazon. And I would be 
very certain if I looked at their uh, financial statements that they paid some tax they didn't need to pay because it wasn't their tax, but because they were considered a vendor in Texas and they had a warehouse there, therefore they should have collected taxes on those business to consumer sales and they paid Texas to get right with the state and get registered. We've done many things over the years whereby our vendor, i.e. our clients, have had to absorb the task of tax of their customers as a cost of doing business in order to properly register across the nation. And frankly, I'm not a big fan of that, right? So why, why should you pay your customer's duty because you also have that corresponding duty? Okay, so that is a nice segue to our next question that we get from tax providers, the, the people the businesses come to for advice. The question is, how do I get people to stop expecting me to know about taxes, especially state taxes, just because I'm a CPA? I've told my employer multiple times over that I'm not a tax expert, yet as we get these Nexus questionnaires daily, they all come to me. So... This is a question that comes up even for somebody like me or us on this podcast because we are also CPAs. And Tram, you and I actually were just on a call with a client that had this issue come up um, with a with their current provider, where they thought that the current provider understood their business, was an expert in all areas, and yet they still had some outstanding issues in some states that their current provider just did not know the rules in. And so that's very common. And and honestly, even myself as a CPA, I have friends, right, that are not in, you know, the CPA. They don't understand everything about CPAs. They just know that I am one. And they'll come to me and they'll ask me questions about, how, what do I do with this uh, federal form for my individual income tax return? You know, and I'll say, well, you're asking the wrong person because I can... You know, I could get my own federal return done, but I am, you know, that's not my expertise. And so I think there is this misnomer uh, amongst business community, um, even within organizations that CPAs are experts in everything. And, and, and it's not true. Um, and state and local tax in particular is very specialized. And it's just one discipline that a CPA can go into, as you've heard from all of our intros we're all, we come from all different backgrounds and we were all attracted to SALT for various different reasons, but we're here and we love it and it's our passion and we continue to do it. But that doesn't mean that uh, a CPA who's in-house uh, working in the accounting group or a CPA that's doing 1040s that, you know, that they would be expected to know everything about state and local tax. And that also goes back to, you know, what Judy was just talking about with Amazon is, I think that, you know, there's some misnomers out there, even in the community that, okay, well, as a CPA, I should know that Amazon is and, and or be expecting that Amazon is collecting tax in all of these jurisdictions. And that's not necessarily true. So even within our own SALT community, there's some confusion and that's where we can absolutely come in and help. And from a Nexus questionnaire perspective, those are just so that everybody knows, those are really fishing expeditions from a state, right? They're if you've ever seen one, they're a few pages long typically, and they're, they're, they ask a lot of questions that are very open-ended. And really, those questions are open-ended in order to trap a taxpayer that just doesn't know any better or any different. And so really, what we like to do and where we can add a lot of value is to help a taxpayer fill those out. Because... Maybe if you read a question in an Nexus questionnaire, it may seem very obvious what that question is asking. And on the surface, you may think, oh, well, I should answer that question in the affirmative based upon my facts. But what we like to do and what's really important to do is to peel away that layer of the onion of the facts to say, okay, what are you really doing in the state? Because Nexus is not necessarily black or white. And so that's where we can provide a lot of value. And that's where having that expertise, even as we are all CPAs, comes in really handy and where we can add a lot of value to our clients. Yeah, and it's funny you say that, Stacey, because I remember, so in two, you know, doing this as long as we have, right? 20, you almost 25 years, me 25 years. I mean, we have seen a fair amount of things in our nation. And I remember when the streamlined sales tax came around and they were trying to create common definitions and trying to create some parity amongst the states, which of course I thought, oh goodness, I got into this career and now that's going away. Well, here we are 20 something years later and SST exists, but it certainly hasn't taken away my job because only 24 states are a part of that. And then through the course of our lives, 
various things have happened nationally and internationally to our world. You know, we've had 9-11, we had the economic crisis in 2007. And at that time is when we saw a plethora of multi-state um, nexus questionnaires being put out by various governmental entities because they went out and said, let's hire non-resident auditors because we know they make the state money. So let's go out and find non-resident taxpayers that are located out of state to bring money into the state by sending these nexus questionnaires. And I suspect we're going to see a lot of that post-COVID because right now everybody's holding tight. We're at a very scary time for all of us, but the governments are hemorrhaging money. <laughs> I Every day I get a notice that some government is furloughing employees or they're short-staffed or they're predicting exponential revenue shortfalls because commerce is not happening in America. Well, we can only sustain that so long before the enforcement begins. So I suspect a year from now, we're going to see significant enforcement in the state and local area. Maybe the Nexus questionnaires will start getting geared up again um, in mass uh, across the nation. And certainly we were seeing that the Wayfair uh, notifications were being sent by various state going after various companies across our nation. And governments have a lot of data. First of all, they can see you on their websites. You can see that you sound bigger than you are. They see you might be doing business in their states. So they come after you that way. And then they get all kinds of other information. And then that is what prompts the Nexus questionnaire. Right. Well, and I think too, right, I think that taxpayers, they get these Nexus questionnaires and they yep. think that they're just sunk, right? That they well, they throw their hands up in the air and they think, oh, based upon the questions, then I definitely have Nexus in this state and okay, what do I need to do now? And, you know, having the Nexus, that might be true. It may not be true, right? Because I mean, I think, again, you have to really dig into the facts and understand what the taxpayers are doing a lot of what the states are looking at in these nexus questionnaires is how are the taxpayers trying to maintain a market or deriving income from a jurisdiction and your facts might or taxpayers facts might be such that they're not maybe they're not directing themselves towards that market um, and maybe on the face it looks like they are but when you really unravel the facts, they really are not. And I, I think that's really hard uh, for a CPA who doesn't specialize in, ta in state and local tax to understand that, right? I think that's the conversation, Stacey, you and I had with our client this morning. Their CPA just doesn't, they don't understand the importance of, you know, the facts as it applies to, you know, the laws of, of other states that they're not in. And they're used to thinking federally. It's all on one. It's one form. It's all federally reported. No big deal. But how you slice and dice that information across the United States really matters. And that's actually quite honestly where we make our we make or save our clients millions of dollars. I mean, in my you know doing this over the years and getting people to understand the value of our group, I show them the money we save them. I mean, we are always money in their pocket, but nobody could hire us full time. There's not enough for us to do, but everybody needs us some of the time. And we can really provide a lot of value add um, by really thinking holistically about the company and their footprint and how best to approach their compliance duties. So we're going to move on to our next question. I think that was a super interesting conversation we had about tax providers, but this next one is from a traveling salesperson. The question posed was, I travel to various states to train adults for a few days or to help solve a problem. If we distribute a good in that state and the retailer pays the sales tax, does that create nexus? That's a really interesting question. It actually ties in pretty nicely to, to the previous conversation as well, because it, it comes back to nexus. Uh, unfortunately, uh, company employees and independent representatives traveling at the States uh, generally do trigger nexus because of their physical presence. Now, nexus is, you know, as, as we've alluded to already, um, an incredibly complicated and heavily case-driven threshold that ends up in a simple yes or no answer. There's no a little bit of nexus. You just have nexus or don't have nexus. But it is it is the threshold question that we ask uh, when we're trying to determine whether a company has a tax collection duty or not in a, in a given taxing mm -hmm. jurisdiction. And it's you know it's it's also important to to consider that that nexus can be different for different tax types. So it's um it's it's important to consider nexus not in a vacuum but holistically across different tax types to understand the uh, the full footprint and duty. 
for the company. I was just going to say a lot of people think, oh, it's a 1099, you know, salesperson. It's not my employee. And as we all know, that doesn't matter. It could be a remote employee. It could be a real employee. It could be an agent. And that could be a nexus creating activity, whether you're a true employee of yours or just a commission agent. And so I think a lot of people ask that question in lieu of the traveling salespeople, whether they're their own employees or not. So I think that's an, a, an important distinction we, we find that a lot of people don't understand when it comes to Nexus. Exactly right. And then we have a couple of uh, cases, uh, namely Tyler Pipe and uh, Scripto, that, that discuss this, uh, this very topic. And, and again, tying it back to the previous discussion, I think you know, certain practitioners who are just not in the space may not be aware of these of these decisions. They do matter as they can change uh, the outcome and the analysis. So uh, coincidentally, um, this reminds me of a story that uh, I had at a, uh, uh, an experience I had at a pre-COVID networking event. I met a gentleman there who was talking about uh, his upcoming retirement. His plans were to purchase an RV and uh, travel the country with his wife. It was uh, it was interesting. He was um, he was telling us that he was one of the company's top salesmen, and the, and the company was was sorry to see him go. So they thought that perhaps there's there was some sort of arrangement that could be made. The company offered to buy the RV for the salesperson and to cover certain travel expenses, you know, uh, gas or and maintenance for the vehicle, for example, on the condition that as they were traveling around the country, they would pop in and visit with some of their current and prospective customers from time to time. So, you know, as, as, as we were talking a bit further, I, I, I got a little concerned from, from a tax perspective. And, and I mentioned to this gentleman, I, I gave him my card and I mentioned to him that, you know, perhaps somebody from the company and, and I should just have a quick chat as to the repercussions of, of, of this offer. And uh, unfortunately, I, I never heard back from them, but I am concerned and, and worried that I may have ruined this person's uh, retirement plans <laughs> because what the outcome of this, uh, of this arrangement might be was it, it might have created nexus for this company all over the country if they didn't already have Nexus in, in, in the States. So anyway, I, I feel a little bad about it, but but hopefully I, I did help the company out. Right. And if you don't get educated, like you said, I mean, people have this perception, like I'm going to make a market. I'm going to sell wherever the heck I want, which of course everybody wants to do. Why would you turn away a sale? But they don't realize the ramification of sending an invoice without a tax on it from a sales tax perspective or possibly an income tax being created by virtue of that sale. Those are things that people don't realize when they're trying to be all things to all people and get the deal done. And um, hopefully our salespeople can be our first line of defense. Quite honestly, the more educated they are and the more business owners are educated, the better um, tax answer can they can get in terms of their compliance costs and their management of those expectations. Speaking of business owners, right, they, they ask us questions too, because the last question we have here comes from a business owner. And the question is, is Square a marketplace? Okay, so this is, this is a fascinating area of, of the law now. So I was mentioning earlier that Wayfair came into place in, on June 21st, 2018. And when that, when that Supreme Court case hit, one of my clients emailed me and said, Merry Christmas and Happy Hanukkah. <laughs> Because all of a sudden, you know, Wayfair makes state and local tax. It's all over the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, you name it. Every day for about a year, it seems something was coming out about Wayfair. And that has to do with this economic presence, $100,000, 200 things, transactions are sold to a jurisdiction, and therefore you have a duty to collect tax, sales tax. Well, after that, on the heels of that, we saw all these marketplace laws hit and I thought to myself, why are we seeing these laws around marketplaces when we've got this Wayfair law? Well, that has to do with the fact that Amazon, in addition to selling goods on its own behalf, i.e. items it inventories and sells to you and me, it also lists other people's items and they ship them to you directly. They never go through an Amazon warehouse. And that we call fulfillment by Amazon. And that is a marketplace, meaning we list your goods, some consumers shop for them and they click on it and buy it. Well, so that's why we saw the marketplace laws hitting the books. And I don't know if we're at 34 states out of the 46 um, that have sales taxes that have a marketplace law, maybe a little higher, but I see that continuing. And that is because Wayfair didn't catch every transaction that happens in commerce. And if you think about Square, Square is merely a credit card processing 
company and it is taking the money or allowing you as a business to take the money. And so whether or not it is a marketplace depends on the contract you have with Square. So marketplace laws are what we call narrow or broad. And a narrow law means you have to do one, two, three, four, five things and you are considered a marketplace. A broad law is more about concept. Um, what are you doing to consummate the sale? What are you doing to make the sale happen in the marketplace? Who's engaging with who? And so it's a really more comprehensive thing. So Square, in my mind, is no different than the ability to take a visa, right? ACH, EFT, debit, whatever. That would not be, as a payment facilitator, you wouldn't per se be a marketplace. But it would depend really on what contract you have with Square in order to process the transactions and how that money gets run through the credit card system, basically. So is Square the one saying, here's the amount due, here you go, I'm invoicing the end user. And as a byproduct, should we be telling Square's interface, please add this tax as because I'm the vendor. So it's really a facts and circumstances set of answers about how you contract with agencies that are credit card processors I would say in a lot of instances, it wouldn't necessarily be a marketplace per se. However, you might need it to collect your tax because you're using it to invoice your customers. So if we think about Airbnb as a contrast to that, they made a decision to go ahead and collect all the lodging tax on behalf of you and I who are renting out our random rooms and our homes because you and I do not really want to get registered as a hotel or motel at the state and local level because there are significant lodging taxes um, in our nation. Go and stay at a hotel and you will see how much you get charged in taxes. It's inordinately high. And so Airbnbs came in and said, I will be a marketplace by choice because I am running the credit card to process the payment for that lodging. I am giving you all that money, but I will remit the taxes on your lodging as a homeowner. So it's a very interesting set of laws that really is still evolving and quite honestly is untested by the courts. So I have no true idea what's going to happen across our nation in terms of enforcement and who is being made to get registered to collect and remit tax. But I would tell you, beware, be mindful, pay attention, because it really could be a trap as to how you interface with different Uh, payment processors to collect the money for the sale and how you get paid. And that could have very much affect um, the duty to be registered as a sales tax vendor. So I think this the policy right behind these marketplace facilitator laws really lie on the fact that, you know, the, the state's rationale behind that is, you know, who's who's getting the information? Who's in the right place to to charge the tax and collect and remit? And I think um, the laws assume, right, the the people who are getting the payment, collecting the payment are maybe the best people to do that. But the complicated part of these marketplaces is that they all operate differently. So just because you're the one processing the payment doesn't necessarily mean that you have all the information needed to collect and remit. That's so, correct. No, because they may not even know like what's being sold and what's the tax consequence. You know, we talk about goods being taxable in every single state in America what we call tangible personal property is taxable everywhere, but it is, it's the services associated with the product that is not taxable everywhere. And if Square is supposed to collect the tax, what is it collecting the tax on? And if you're selling a thing, that's a heck of a lot easier than selling a service like software or shipping and handling, which has a lot of sales tax consequences that bifurcate by state. It's not clear when you sell a good, whether the shipping and handling associated with You've got warranties, you have returns, you have discounts, you have allowances. All of those create a layer of complexity around the taxation of a thing versus a service associated with that thing. So sales tax has a lot of nuances in terms of um, what is taxable where and why. So it's very important to understand that you're exactly right. Square may not very well know that. Even if it is deemed to be a marketplace, how would it know what to tax where? It may not have those tax decisions across America. And honestly, I remember years ago, Amazon saying that they would be happy to collect tax on on um, behalf of fulfillment by Amazon, meaning they fulfill your sale, they take the goods, but you're considered the vendor, the e-commerce person that uses Amazon's uh, marketplace. 
they'll collect the tax for you, but they're going to charge you for it. So it was a moneymaker for them, honestly, um, was to be that conduit as a sales tax collector and remitter. So there's a lot of complexities around that. I think a lot of taxpayers do not understand, and it really becomes a trap for the unwary to unravel all that. You want to make it simple, but it, it just isn't always simple in order to manage your tax consequence in terms of how you do business. All right. Well, my name is Judy Vordren, and I'm just going to close by saying thanks for taking the time to spend with us. You know, we have been doing this for a long time and we seem to get a lot of the same questions. And so the interest in putting this podcast out there was because we really believe in what we do and we want to inform the public as best as possible so that people can have the best strategic state and local tax answers possible um, from a holistic perspective. And so that's why we're taking information from you and trying to give that back to you um, with our area of expertise as a team. You'll get to meet more of our teammates on our next podcast. And we're also going to have a special guest. Her name is Diane Yetter, and she runs the Sales and Use Tax Institute. She has been training people in this area. She was actually kind of revolutionary. I joke like she was the Uber of sales tax training because she's been doing it for over 25 years. And I think people said to her way back when it, there wasn't a need for it. Well, she's laughing now because she's still doing it. In fact, this week she's doing it remotely via Zoom meetings and all that. So she's going to get on with us on our next podcast and talk about her experience in the industry and how she's grown and evolved to find um, how to serve you and explain how to use, how to manage state and local taxes across the nation. This podcast is for educational purposes only and is not intended, nor should it be relied upon as legal, tax, accounting, or investment advice. To consult with a competent professional to discuss specifics of your situation and the applicability of the information presented.